Hi, everyone. Welcome to the 15th episode of Genealogy Pep Talk, a podcast. My name is Suzanne. I am a senior library specialist with Arapaho Libraries here in Colorado. I have two other staff members with me who are buddies and co-hosts of this podcast. Uh, there is Cindy, a library specialist, and Katie, a career services librarian. Hi, ladies. Hello. Hi. This podcast is about gathering some tips and tricks for your family's search journey for whenever you get stuck on searching for an ancestor, because it does happen. We also share with you some experiences of our own, along with anecdotes and stories in researching our own families. We have a special guest star today, and her name is Robin. She is a library specialist here at Arapaho Libraries, and she has given Cindy, Katie, and me a pop quiz about her genealogy history. My top three favorite questions are about a witch, a foot, and Germantown, Pennsylvania, which also sounds like the beginning to a joke. Hi, Robin. <laughs> Hello. So uh, we are curious because we three, I'm assuming I'll talk for um, Cindy and Katie, that uh, we didn't know we were going to get a test on uh, genealogy. I welcome it personally. I don't know about you ladies. Do you? Oh, yeah. Okay. I always welcome a test. <laughs> <laughs> So um, you have a lot of interesting uh, things uh, on your quiz, and which are points that we are going to discuss. But give us a little bit of background about you, where your family is kind of from, and where you're from. Well, I'm from Denver, so born and bred. And uh, my, I have a sister who lives in Minnesota now, and she and I are the ones that share this genealogy together. Um, I have a daughter and a husband, of course. And my daughter is now grown, but she was adopted from China. Mm. So that plays in an interesting way into my outlook on genealogy. She um, came to us in 2002, and I had a bunch of genealogical materials that I hadn't paid much attention to, but at least had read a little bit of. And I was interested in genealogy, but when my daughter came along as an adoptee in our family, I thought about it. I thought... She doesn't have her history, and I have mine. Mm -hmm. And that felt unfair to me. It also yeah. felt like I didn't want to pursue mine at the time. Mm -hmm. Of course, now she's grown on her own, out of the house, and I'm back to it. Um, I've offered to share uh, some costs of doing a 23andMe, so she might be able to get some of hers. Mm -hmm. But I think we're privileged to have genealogy records when we have it. Uh, yeah, totally agree. Yeah, Robin, you had... I was just perusing your materials, and it looks like your grandmother really compiled a lot of the information that you have built your research on. Is that right? Yes, she did. She's really, the that branch of the family has the most history, and it's the Pillsburys. Her name was Martha Lynette Pillsbury, and she lived from 1892 to 1984. And uh, she did join the DAR. So she was a lifetime member of the Daughters of the American Revolution. And I think in preparation for that membership, she had to produce her genealogy. So I have a document called The Pedigree of Martha Lynette Pillsbury. And there's a copyright by someone in 1895 who I think was a person who did genealogy way back when. So, wow. Mm. <laughs> so did she write a letter to, for the, for the DE, DAR, I'm assuming, and then having to go get the documents and then send all that in to the DE, DAR to prove she is a daughter of the American Revolution? I don't know, because I actually never talked to her about that, and I should have. Mm -hmm. um, I, she prepared this so that she could have her membership, and I think it was required. And the one thing I do remember, talking either to my mother or to her, I think probably to my mother, that if I wanted to join the DAR, I would have to do my own genealogy all over again. Mm -hmm. I couldn't just use hers, wow. okay. if I'm recalling that correctly. Yeah. And I think that yeah. I was told that as a young adult or child. Even. Because I, that was my next question. I was going to ask, are you a member of DAR? No, I'm not. Okay. And I'm not because my daughter can't join. She mm -hmm. can't join as being an adopted daughter of someone who has that genealogy. So mm. I choose not to. Mm. Okay. Are we jumping ahead of assuming that you are Pillsbury of Pillsbury flour and Pillsbury baking products? Unfortunately, no. I think in the Pillsbury gene genealogy and Pillsbury line, the sixth generation was where we split off. Mm. And the Pillsburys that were in New Hampshire, our branch stayed, 
but the others went to Minnesota, uh, right. put together a flour mill, and we did not partake in those riches. And that stings for us because we don't have any cookies here. That's right. <laughs> but I have research and at least can know where that broke off. Yeah. And so that's interesting to know. And there's a good book that I have about the Minnesota Pillsbury's mm, okay. that I'll want to read at some point in time after I digest most of my own family history. Wow. Interesting. The flour mill owner Pillsbury was John Sargent Pillsbury. And he was actually a cousin to my great-great-grandfather, Colonel William Stoughton Pillsbury, and I'll talk about him because there's a lot of information about him. Um, so Micah Pillsbury was the common ancestor with us and the flour mill, Minnesota flour mill Pillsbury's. So he was the father of both our relative Stephen Pillsbury and another person, John Micah Pillsbury, and the sons of John Micah, including John Sargent, were the ones that left New Hampshire and went to Minnesota and became rich. Okay. The book that I was referring to uh, (laughs) is a good book. I think I haven't delved much into it, but about the Pillsburys of Minnesota and the author's Lori, L-O-R-I, Sturdevant, S-T-U-R-D-E-V-A-N-T. And that gives the history of the Pillsburys starting from when they came to Minnesota. Those Pillsburys. Not our Pillsburys. (laughs) Those Pillsburys. (laughs) (laughs) The rich ones. Yeah. So, Robin, first of all, I have to say that you are quite prepared today with all of your um, ephemera. (laughs) And you have uh, books and notebooks and loose leaf paper and post-it little reminder flag thingies and all kinds of typed up documents. So that is a good uh, genealogist, first of all, because you have organized all of your, I'm assuming your family members, right? Because it looks like you have some color coordination over there. Yes. And uh, and that's great. So that's one thing to learn. I Once again, if, if you remember for the, all the other 14 episodes prior to this, I have organization in piles at home of my people. Uh, so this is uh, this is really good. Let's talk about the, your mother's side. You have very interesting people in your family tree, but they go and people that you will out there listeners will know who these people are um, that Robin is related to. But let's start at the beginning, though, when Germantown, which is a Quaker town founded outside of Philadelphia in 1650s, somewhere around there, your family was part of that beginning, correct? Yes, and that's something I recently stumbled on. I had all the documentation for the Pillsbury side of the family, but this is my grandmother. And the Tyson is her maternal side, whereas the Pillsbury is her paternal side. And the information I found when I was reading a very important document, the autobiography of my great-great-grandfather. And his name was Ira C. Tyson. He was a minister, so Reverend Ira C. Tyson. He lived from 1830 to 1901, and he wrote an autobiography. And I had read some snatches of it in my earlier days, And I decided doing this genealogical research to read through the whole thing. And what I stumbled on is that I thought the Pillsburys coming from 1640 were pretty out there and far back. But the Tyson side is the side that came to Germantown, Pennsylvania. And interestingly, they were from Germany. I thought my mother's history was English and Irish, but it's German as well. And it was William Penn who went to a certain part of Germany and was trying to entice people to come to the United States. And my great, well, several, several greats, relative, ancestor, um, was last name Tyson. And I found that Tyson was spelled several different ways. Mm. Mm. And from T-I-S-E-N all the way to what we know as T-Y-S-O-N. And his first name, the one that came over that was converted by William Penn and then came over to Germantown, one of the first original families that founded Germantown. His name was Reinert, R-E-I-N-E-R-T, and there was various spellings of that. And then his um, progeny ended up having the name Reinier, R-Y-N-E-A-R. But they did come over as 
several different families, 13 families from a place in Germany, I'll spell it G-R-I-E-S-H-E-I-M, Grisham, I'm hoping that's right, or Grisham with a C, and they came to Philadelphia and settled near Germantown. Hmm. And they were one of the first settlers of Germantown, the first Quakers. Yes. Hmm. That is so interesting. Yeah. Can I ask you, where did you find an autobiography of somebody who lived from 1831? Is that correct? 1830 to 1901. And yes. it was given to me, mm. passed okay. down through our family. Yeah. Mm. I have the originals that Ira C. Tyson wrote in kind mm. of a ledger journal book. Wow. And then my grandmother typed it up. My sister has the typed versions. Yeah. And my grandmother had a hand injury due to a car accident. And she wrote that she this was a two-finger left-handed <laughs> production. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so that's sacred to me, the way right. she cared for just putting this together so that we would have it. And then a cousin of ours finally put it together, had his secretary type it. He was in, involved in the United Bank of Denver and pretty high up, so he could get somebody to do that. Sure. And so we have uh, a typed version that we've had for probably 20 or 30 years. Mm. That's great wow. that and your grandmother yeah. thought that that was important enough instead of just throwing it in some attic trunk mm. yeah. and a couple generations later someone opens the trunk and says, what is this junk? Yeah. So yes. and got to hand it to your grandmother. And you know what? And that's gold, that kind it of is. stuff. And you need to take very good care of that, you know? Um, I do. I guess what they call it in the art world, the provenance of mm -hmm. where it came from and so forth. And it's, um, it's gold. So, you know, once you're done here, lock it in a vault somewhere <laughs> or, mm -hmm. or, you yeah. know, a lockbox and, you know, keep it safe from flood and fire. I was just going to say, I wonder if this was a more common practice um, in the like late 1800s, early 1900s, because my grandma has a, found a book from the Flynn side of the family, and it, it's called I, John, Take Thee, Sarah, and it's like a wow. family history, and so we have wow. like copies of that. So I wonder if this was a more common practice Might have during a certain per time period. We should do some research on yeah. that. That would be interesting to know. Well, well, I think, you know, what's interesting is that, you know, genealogy folks out there you've heard of the family bible mm. where it's not just the bible but it's actually all of the birth dates and death dates and christenings yeah. thank you baptismal <laughs> those baptisms. all those kinds of records and so those were gold because that's what they handed down mm -hmm. uh you know in generations ago so this is probably you know a more text version yes yeah, really important to me for two other reasons one is that i have a picture of the Reverend Ira C. Tyson, a very large picture in my dining room that I've mm, had oh, for quite a while nice. wow. that was in my grandmother's house out at the bottom of a stairwell and when she died in the late, in 1984. So I have that. And then this document, his autobiography, details the family history and some social things, who he voted for and mm -hmm. who he met, some famous people. Yeah. Wow. And then his conversion experience, because his family was Quaker, and he ended mm. up being a Presbyterian minister. Mm. Wow. So that was, that's, <laughs> that's the goal for me, yeah. is his, his thoughts and feelings, and knowing that this person right. that I have on my dining room wall, I, yeah. I, I, I know his words, I know some of his thoughts. And his you, feelings, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you happen to have a picture of that? Yes, I do. Oh, you do? Oh, let's see it. <laughs> you folks can't see it out there, but we're well, going to describe it While you're looking that up, you. I just wanted to say, and I know that Suzanne and I do talk about this, the genealogy course that we took through University of Wisconsin-Madison online. Okay, so someone like your great-great-grandfather was, as a Presbyterian minister, I'm sure he was somebody in that town and mm -hmm. had an influence on the community and so when he wrote that, that may have gone into some local historical society and been put up on Google Books. Because we read a story about some people, uh, local history, that was found on Google Books. I think some of his sermons might have been in print that I might try to obtain when I can. Yeah, so that's kind of like yeah. a treasure trove, depending yeah. who your ancestors are. But I never knew about that. Did you, mm. Suzanne? Mm-mm. Yeah, so it was very interesting. Yeah. Yes. Well, that picture, real quick, is uh, this uh, man who has a long beard and uh, short hair and uh, no no glasses, uh, but he's sitting in a big, looks like a big, heavy wood oak chair kind of deal, 
sepia tone uh, and uh, just sitting there, just just sitting there with authority. And, yeah. uh, and imagine having that looking at you while you're eating a plate of spaghetti or something. He's always behind table. me. I oh, sit. Okay. I sit where he can't look at me right. and watch me eat. <laughs> right. right. What I was going to say about Germantown, I was kind of uh, tickled because on my mother's father's mother's side, her father uh, was born in Philadelphia uh, around 1838 or so. He was a he owned a bakery, and in the sense that he's a, under uh, as like a baker and confectioner and so forth. But uh, I wondered, and I, you know, I've seen the street names, of course. But uh, his father was the uh, progenitor, uh, which is the immigrant ancestor, and he came from Germany. Uh, his name is John Stout, S T O U T. And then his father, I'm still trying to figure it out, but I'm pretty much sure it's uh, Johann or Johanna Stout. And but he came from Germany. I'm thinking because this is what you do. You don't have all the information. So you're kind of putting all of the information together, what makes sense to you. So to me, Germantown, a lot of people speaking German, I'm assuming that maybe he came through uh, one of the ports, Philadelphia, because that's kind of easy, and then just happened to cruise on through to Germantown. And okay. then maybe, you know, from there, you know, maybe he went to Philadelphia or maybe his son, John Stout, went to Philadelphia. So, you know, you just have to kind of figure out that line. Of course... That could be totally wrong, and maybe he came in through another po point port and didn't even go through Germantown. You know, went on the other side of Philadelphia. So we just don't know, but it just kind of makes sense when you think about it. That was my point. And maybe a Tyson and a Stout knew each other. That's true. Somewhere down the line. You know, maybe maybe he came in, hey, you know, I'm getting some bread, getting yep. a nice cake, you know. I need a little cake with my coffee. And you know? then he goes to the church and listens to his exactly. sermon. Right. Yes. His sermon. So <laughs> right. Right. it's all interconnected. Yeah. Those exactly. six degrees of separation there. Uh, and that's, that's my right. favorite thing. I love that. I love it. All right. Everybody has some dirt and some really good stuff <laughs> in their family history, right? Uh, we all do. Either a big one, a lot, or a little tiny one. So this might be a medium sized one. So tell us about the indentured servant. This is William Pillsbury, and it's our common Pillsbury ancestor. My sister and I are 11 generations away from him. And I don't think my grandmother, Martha Pillsbury Gehagen, knew about this little tidbit when she was applying for the DAR, putting together her pedigree or having that put together for her. <laughs> but I looked up William Pillsbury and found in WikiTree – an interesting thing, I was looking for when he came over, and it was questionable between 1620-something all the way up to 1640. But then they talked about court records, and around the time of 1640, it said that the first record of William in New England is the following record from a quarter court held at Boston on June 1st, 1641. And I kind of thought, court, what's going on with that? It says, William Pillsbury and Dorothy Crosby were bound to the good behavior to appear at the next court bound in 10 pounds, whatever that means, mm. but they were in court. And then there was a further court record saying that William Pillsbury was in court in first in June and then in July of 1641 for defiling his master's house and was <laughs> censured to be whipped. Wow. wow. Dorothy was censured to be whipped for her uncleanness and defiling her master's house. Whoa. And so WikiTree interprets that from these records, it appears that as of June 1641, William and Dorothy were indentured servants who had been caught having premarital relations in their master's house. <laughs> wow. And the court records end up in some way of detailing the fact that they eventually were married within, I think, that month period of time. Mm. Don't know if they were betrothed or right. if the marriage came because of <laughs> right. the defilement. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. And the fact that they were whipped. Yeah. I I'm assuming that's a public whipping. Yeah. You know, like 40 lashes or whatever. Right. I'm assuming that was public to deter other people from Absolutely. following down that <laughs> naughty path. A yes. little reminder. Yeah. Yikes. Boy, that is like a romance novel. Yeah. Well, they, they <laughs> got together and then we are 
uh, the progeny. Right. So yeah. right. 11 <laughs> generations later. <laughs> That's right. My sister and I. <laughs> yeah. That's so, funny. and how did you find that? Did you just stumble on a court document that had his name? Or how did you I get just that? looked at it in WikiTree. Oh. You all are more... Um, experts, I think, or just more experienced in looking things up. I come with a rich family history, mm. and now I'm on b- embarking on trying to um, find out more than what I have and also to confirm some things mm. to make sure what I have is actually correct. And so I just looked his name up on WikiTree, and that's what I came up with. <laughs> Very interesting. Yes. And good detective work, Robin. Yeah. I applaud Excellent. you. It was fun. <laughs> Okay, so what now what we're going to talk about is a colonel, a Civil War colonel, right? Yes, okay. my great-great-grandfather. Okay. That's Colonel William Stoughton, S-T-O-U-G-H-T-O-N, Pillsbury. Not to be confused with the earlier William Pillsbury, but they're both Williams. And this uh, relative of mine, I, hear, I have a lot of information on because he was a prominent citizen in Derry, New Hampshire. Mm. And I have a book, actually, that... Um, was written about Derry called Nutfield Rambles by a historian named Richard Holmes. And my family, in 2007, we even took my daughter, she was about six six years old at the time, and we went to Derry, New Hampshire. And it's D-E-R-R-Y. Correct, yes. yes. And so we saw a museum that had a lot of information about him, and then I got the copy of the book. Mm-hmm. And so in my family history, he's covered also pretty well. And it talks about his Civil War record. And what is most of note is his involvement in two different battles. And one was called the Battle of South Mountain, and the other was Antietam. Antietam is the more well-known. The Battle of South Mountain occurred just a little ways away from the town of Sharpsburg, where Antietam Creek and that area was. And it was at the Battle of South Mountain that Lieutenant, he was a lieutenant at the time, Pillsbury, Mm -hmm. gave proof of his vigilance, perception and knowledge of tactics, which without doubt saved a portion of the companies of his regiment from almost sure destruction. His company Mm -hmm. was leading a charge upon a large force of the enemy who were driven through a piece of woods and disappeared while the Union forces moved into an open field adjoining. The enemy formed under the protection of a battery, and their movements were obscured by Lieutenant Pillsbury, who halted his men and fell back sufficiently to avoid the fire of the battery and to be supported by other forces just at the moment when Major General Reno rode along the line into the ambush and received a terrible volley from the rebels, screened by the woods, and was instantly killed, very near the same ground occupied a few moments before by Company A of the New Hampshire Regiment and other Union forces. Wow. Mm -hmm. So it's nice to know that that your relative was a hero in a battle. Yeah, it is. Right, (laughs) right. And that's is that a military description? This was came from Find a Grave. Mm. Oh, okay. And a similar description is in the Nutfield Rambles book. Mm-hmm. Okay, I just want to make a distinction that, yeah. yes, these were written by people in the North. Yeah, probably. Mm-hmm. Okay. But then the other part of the story is the Battle of Antietam. And this comes more from family lore than anything, because mm-hmm. I can't find it documented. And okay. I haven't really tried all sources, but yeah. I would like to it someday. Yeah. But in the... Pedigree of Martha Lynette Pillsbury, the genealogy that she had prepared for her DAR membership. Um, there's some narrative, and this talks about the Battle of Antietam. And it was something that I think family members, at least my mother, had talked about. I don't know where she got it, whether she heard it from my grandmother or, or if she had just read this herself. But during the Battle of Antietam, Colonel Pillsbury was in the 9th New Hampshire and was on a bridge called the Burnside Bridge. And I've actually gone and visited that bridge during an earlier trip with my own husband back in 94, I think. And so during this um, battle, the Union forces moved forward. Grandpa Pillsbury, and this is by one of his grandchildren who wrote this, had been left on the bridge for dead. And after they moved away, a Southern family secreted him to their home, nursed him back to health and strength, and smuggled him back into Northern Territory. Whoa. That's great. Man, that's a movie. It yeah, is. It's, it's a wonderful know? story. He is a movie. Yeah. He is a movie because yeah. I found out other stuff about him, too, just personally. Just mm-hmm. I was just really interested when you gave us the information. And um, it says that he got married in, in May of 1954, 1854, excuse me, May of 1854, 
was married for a month before the lady passed away. Oh, no. Yes, and both That's grandfathers right. had that experience, actually. Oh, both wow. great, great grandfathers. Yeah. Ira yeah. Tyson as well. And mm. then it says mm. he got remarried in um, April of 1856. But one source I read said that he had seven children. Another one said that he had they had nine children. Five of them died in childbirth or childhood, excuse me. They had one other source says they had nine children. Five of them died in childhood. They also had a son named Ulysses Grant, which makes sense. Yes. I bet there are a lot of Ulysses Grants <laughs> walking around. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And of those relatives, I had read that too, that there were nine children, and I only knew of four. So if some source said nine and five died, mm -hmm. that's very interesting. But childhood mortality was was right. prominent. But the four that lived. There was, first of all, Rosecrans Pillsbury, and he was named after a Civil War general as well. Wow. <laughs> and he features prominently in the Nutfield Rambles book because he remained in Derry, New Hampshire. And so he inherited a shoe factory that Colonel William Sutton Pillsbury owned and operated, and he was prominent in politics. And I haven't sussed that whole thing out exactly right. what he did, but I think he, he was pretty involved in the town. And then there was my great-grandfather, Charles Hobart Long Pillsbury. And so he's the branch that came to Colorado. Oh, Everybody else stayed okay. in New Hampshire. Huh. Mm -hmm. And then there was the only girl in the family, Harriet Pillsbury, and she was related to the Mack family, we'll probably talk about later. And then the last was Ulysses Grant, and he did die at a young age. Mm. Yeah, it said 28 on my thing. Mm. I just uh, saw another thing that I thought was, was very personally interesting, uh, in this, and it was from NewHampshireHistory.org. Mm, I hadn't looked at that. Oh yeah, I, and it's kind of a gold mine because it said <laughs> it ex it describes him as exceedingly attractive and cordial in manner. Oh, <laughs> so he's a nice looking fellow yeah. and kind of an easygoing guy. Yeah, sounds a like bit of a charmer, maybe. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. The, the picture I have of him, he was balding, probably <laughs> when he was a colonel, <laughs> and. He was pictured with several prominent um, politicians, I think a governor and some other mm -hmm. folks. Mm -hmm. So I didn't bring that picture or even mm -hmm. take a picture of that, but that's the one I remember of him, not in his younger age. Would have mm. been nice to have some of those younger ones, too. Would have liked to know him. Yeah. I'm curious, well, though, about the shoe factory. But before that, what about the foot? Oh, oh. we've got feet all kinds of feet yeah, themes. Feet are a theme through your yeah. <laughs> ancestry. <laughs> yes, you asked about a foot. Yeah. It's interesting when you find an old letter from 1864, and it talks about finding a foot. And this is a Civil War letter from a man named Morris Tyson. So this is the Tyson side of the family, I think. And he's writing to my dear brother. Mm -hmm. And what I can't figure out is exactly who my dear brother is. I have an idea. I think it is Ira C. Tyson because there was a Maurice um, listed as a sibling. Not a Morris, but a Maurice, so yeah. maybe there's a connection, maybe the spelling yeah, of spelling names and things. The letter is signed Morris, M-O-R-R-I-S. And so I'm thinking it is Ira Tyson, the Reverend, asking about the spirituality of those men. That's my idea of mm -hmm. why that might be who he's writing to. But the interesting part of the letter is he <laughs> writes in this 1864 letter that I actually have in my possession that... He was camped near Mitchell Station, Virginia, and a quote from the letter says, In Culpeper, Virginia, he references that earlier, I visited the Piedmont house that the rebels had used as a hospital, and in looking through the rooms, I found a human foot and the floor covered with blood. Oh. So, oh, that's, yes. Oh, I'm telling you, it's That a really movie. brings it home. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I also um, looked at that letter again and noted that he talked about slave records. There I visited the courthouse and examined many an old writing in shape of the last will and testament of some old Virginia nabob or rece receipts or bills of sale of slaves. Wow. And then he went on to talk about the foot. Oh, oh wow. Yeah. Wow, that's an interesting letter. <laughs> yeah, it and is. a lot to talk about. Mm. Sure is. And I wonder where those records are now, you know, if they just got burned, tossed somewhere. Are they in a family's 
you know, good keeping. Exactly. Who who ended yeah. up with them? Yeah, they're in a trunk somewhere in someone's yeah. attic or basement. Yeah. Too. So look in your trunks and attics and basements <laughs> for stuff. <laughs> so much intrigue and mystery. So you had a foot. What about the shoe? Well, Colonel William Pillsbury, who was a lieutenant back in the Battle of South Mountain, eventually became a colonel after the war. And he was a prominent citizen in Derry, New Hampshire, and he actually had a shoe factory. He was the owner, operator, and then owner, I believe. So there's a lot about the shoe factory in the book Nutfield Rambles. And what I gleaned from it was the fact that it was pretty big, and it said they sold 500 different styles of shoes. I have it in another uh, record that says 400, so I'm not sure which part came from the book. And this was starting in 1881, and they sold on five different continents. So they had sales representatives traveling the world to sell these shoes. Wow. And I think the shoe industry was a very big industry in the Derry, New Hampshire area. Hmm. Yeah, it must have been. Yeah. yeah, and I don't remember what year, but eventually when the shoe factory uh, closed down, they converted those into apartments. But <laughs> I even believe during the time hmm. he provided housing for some of the workers. and hmm. So he was wow. a well-known man in the town. They talk about yeah. the street of Broadway being largely developed by him. Wow. Wow. So what I found it to be kind of interesting uh, that you have this connection and your former job before working here at the library uh, was also, I find, pretty interesting, but you being a retired probation officer. Correct. Uh, and then I was looking at your information here and, and I found it interesting that you have a relative who was almost assassinated by a parolee. And my question is, did you... When you decided to be become a probation officer, did you even know that history prior? I didn't, you didn't. But I found that out after the fact, and it was just really interesting yeah. that I felt a connection to him. Yeah. Just I was going to say. Although yeah. as a probation officer, I didn't carry a gun. Right. Yeah. People dealing with parolees did. Yeah. And the parolee in this yeah. instance obviously did. So the story is in the family lore um, about Grandpa Pillsbury, Colonel William Stoughton Pillsbury, and one of his relatives, a uh, grandson, I think, said, I once asked Grandpa Pillsbury about a scar in the web of his right hand between his mm. thumb and his forefinger. Mm. He told me that he had made it a point in his life that in, uh, in a lonely spot, at least, he would never let anyone get in a position behind him. The rest of the story may have come from Grandpa, but probably from Grandma or another relative, mother or father. And this is, again, my, my relative on the Mac side, quoting this, it seems that Grandpa was, on the occasion at the then almost deserted railway, railroad station of White River Junction, Vermont, with a long wait for his train. Hmm. There was another person there, the only other person in or about the station. The two of them sat on benches at times, read the papers, and paced the floor at intervals to break the monotony. Grandpa kept in the corner of his eye on the other man. Suddenly, Grandpa realized that his lone companion was nowhere in sight. He wheeled around just in time to throw his right hand down upon a revolver, which was aimed about in line with his heart. Ooh. The trigger was pulled, but the hammer embedded itself in his hand instead of detonating the charge, which would have undoubtedly proved fatal. The would-be assassin, taken into custody, turned out to be a parolee from the state's prison whom Grandpa Pillsbury, as a county commissioner a few years earlier, had arrested and caused to be imprisoned. Oh. Wow. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> so if that had gone off, then again, right. I yeah. might not be here. Right, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. yeah, there's always that interesting thing of the what ifs. You know, exactly. what if someone took a different path or a different fork in the road, you know? Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, he was certainly one of the most colorful characters in your yeah. Yeah. family history. Mm -hmm. And that, And you found a lot of that stuff out just by digging on your own or getting well, stories... Um, handed down through your family. I have to credit the stories handed down from my grandmother's DAR -D genealogy, the pedigree of Martha Lynette Pillsbury, and the information that was added in by Andrew Mack. Hmm. He's the one that is related to us by marriage, and he compiled a lot of this. He was the one who wrote this about Grandpa. Okay, so um, now let's talk about Colorado. You were born <laughs> and raised here. Yes, Colorado. I was. But you also, there's an earlier person that uh, lived in Colorado. It was in Palmer Lake. Yes, so the Pillsburys, all being in New Hampshire, had the four siblings, and Charles Hobart Long, the second son, 
was the one that came to Colorado. And so he came, ironically, because of consumption. A lot of people came mm-hmm. to Colorado for the dry air. Right. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. then it turned out it wasn't consumption. It was just a cold. <laughs> but wow. that's how he mm-hmm. landed here mm-hmm. and how our branch of the family landed here. Yeah. And so he um, started out in Palmer Lake, Colorado. And it was a time when that was newly developed, and I can't remember the year. But um, he and another Charles Pillsbury, I guess that name was common, and mm-hmm. I don't believe they were related. And they, they started a store. They were asked to start a store and worked as postmasters. Wow. So, wow. Yes. And yeah. so then Charles Hobart Long, uh, who is my great-grandfather, uh, Martha Pillsbury's father, and he ended up um, becoming involved in the United Bank of Denver as mm-hmm. some type of an officer. Wow. Yeah. So. Wow. And for those of you who don't know, the listeners who don't know, but Palmer Lake's about 40 miles straight south of Denver. It is still the, this tiny little town. Mm-hmm. It's a speed trap yeah. for anyone who doesn't know <laughs> that's one yeah. thing. But there are cute little stores there. Yeah. There's some restaurants. There's a cute little ice cream yeah. parlor we always took our kids to. Yeah. So, uh, and I remember going up there to visit and seeing the very rickety old cabin house that belonged to our family. And mm-hmm. my my own father didn't want us to spend the night there because he thought the house would fall down. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Interesting. It's been <laughs> torn down since. Yeah. And it's still like a one-horse town with a little Pretty main much. street. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I have a book called Palmer Lake, A Historical Narrative mm. by Marion Savage Sabin, S-A-B-I-N. So that's where I got that information other than family lore. Nice. I'm glad people wrote these books <laughs> yeah. about yes. these right. little <laughs> tiny communities. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you have a, another family name, and you mentioned earlier, but it's Mac. M-A-C-K. M-A-C-K. I was just going to say, I bet it's M-A-C-K. Mm-hmm. Tell us about them. Well, it's the relative that I have record of is Andrew Robert Mack, and he was an admiral in the Navy. And he wrote, I believe, some of the narrative in my grandmother's genealogy, the pedigree of Martha Lynette Pillsbury, and he included some of his own family. So the Mack family are related to us by marriage through the Pillsburys. So the four Pillsbury um, children of, of Colonel William Stoughton Pillsbury uh, the third daughter, Harriet, was was Harriet Lavinia Pillsbury, and she married a Mac. That's how we're related to them. And they have some interesting relatives of their own. <laughs> I'm not surprised. Yeah. Cabin holding, 26.5. Roger, ground guidance is okay. Roger, 2G. So, uh, who's the astronaut? Well, we are related by marriage to Alan Bartlett Shepard. Mm, and okay. so he grew up in the town of Derry. Mm-hmm. And he's and the Alan, Alan Shepard, right? Exactly. That famous astronaut. Okay. Wow. So First I'm not American related. in space, fifth man to walk on the moon. Yeah, that's him. I can't say I'm related by blood, but by marriage. Yeah. Through, still, through that Mac site. Still pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but when we went to the, the trip in 2007, when we went to Derry, New Hampshire, that museum features a lot about him. So it's kind of nice to say you're kind of related to an astronaut. Mm. Yeah. I mean, museums dedicated to your relatives mm-hmm. or related by marriage relatives, yeah. that's something. Yes, it is. Okay, so what about the witch? That's interesting. There's a witch in the family, although, again, by marriage, the Mac side of the family is related to Rebecca Nurse. And she was hanged, and she was an older woman. So it's kind of amazing to realize that someone like that would be not found not guilty. She was found guilty. Mm -hmm. And I've read various histories about her, and... Probably some of the readers have. But it's interesting that she almost got off, but she was hard of hearing, and Mm. she was not answering a question correctly. Mm. And she had earlier (laughs) said something about one of the other people that were jailed for being a witch, that she Mm. is one of us. Mm. But I believe what she meant is she was one of us. She's in the jail with us, not she's Mm. one of us as we're all witches. Mm. But it was, was misunderstood, and even given the chance, the jury still came back with a guilty verdict. 
Yeah, and so. she was 71 years old, so mm, yeah. you, she wasn't a teenager yeah. or anything like that. That's and sad. she was a prominent woman in the town. I understand that the Rebecca Nurse um, homestead is still out there by Salem. In, this in, d- in a in town Salem. called Danvers, I think, is where it's located. And that was another thing that we visited on our 2007 trip. Mm. Yeah, so wow. a lot of the evidence of her still stands. And mm-hmm. then what I read was like 20 years later or 10 years later, the accuser had recanted. As a younger kid even, I knew that family lore. So mm-hmm. I could say that we were related to a witch. Right. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, yeah. and right. um, Arthur Miller's Crucible mm-hmm. has her as a character, mm-hmm. and yes. the subsequent movies have yeah. Yeah. all have her as mm-hmm. a character. Yeah. So she was actually written in Arthur Miller's play, which is based on history, but wasn't all. It's not all historical fact, but he did write her character in. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Interesting. So there's one actual movie on top of the should be movies in your family. <laughs> that's true. Exactly. Right. That's true. <laughs> but, yeah. And so in talking about uh, the Admiral An- Andrew Mack, he was alive when I was a, a young kid, and um, he knew Norman Rockwell. And that was what we heard about in our family. Mm -hmm. And my sister at the time wanted to be an artist. She's since become a CPA. I don't know how much (laughs) art that involves. But she wanted to be an artist. And my mother said, oh, your relative knew Norman Rockwell and posed for a Norman Rockwell Saturday Post cover. And he did. The Admiral was known for being knowing how to salute. And so Norman Rockwell, as his neighbor, recruited him. For one of the post covers and so my sister actually wrote a letter to norman rockwell saying i want to be an artist and what should you do and and he wrote back and huh. so we have a framed letter from norman rockwell oh wow and then as i was looking more towards the relationship between admiral mack and rockwell they were neighbors and so they they knew each other well i think i found out that uh admiral mack also had a cameo, cameo appearance in a tv documentary about rockwell Oh, wow. Oh. I just recently learned that. Oh, wow. That's pretty Yeesh. cool. So I now you have a yeah. play, a film, a <laughs> right. TV documentary, a Saturday Painting. Evening Post <laughs> cover, yeah. Yeah. and then movies that should be made. Right. Yeah. That's right. I yeah. did find that, that that painting that you referred to is called Salute the Flag, mm. and it was in 1971. Salute the Flag by Norman Rockwell, 1971. Really? Because of mainly two documents, the genealogy that my grandmother did for her DAR application Mm -hmm. and the autobiography that my great-great-grandfather wrote. They're both so rich. A lot of families may have these same stories, Mm -hmm. but they may never know because Mm -hmm. they don't have these documents that were saved and handed down and stories that were handed down between generations. So your family is very rich Mm-hmm. in yeah. all of that and they all kind of cared about each other's ancestors that's that's mm-hmm. really interesting yeah. yeah it's like a big basket of pillsbury goodies <laughs> exactly <laughs> and again thanks mainly to my my grandmother martha lynette pillsbury Gehagen. lynette is a common middle name that i share with her and my mother shared mm. and if anyone's at the library and here's the greeting greetings when you come in the door, I say that because that's how she liked to talk to people. <laughs> she said greetings instead oh. of hello. Very cool. <laughs> Very nice. Okay, we've got a couple more things that we don't want to pass up. But uh, can you talk about your Volga German ancestors. Yes, that's the part, the branch of the family that I know least about in terms of their actual history. I do know that my grandmother, Julia Greenwald Wolf, came over in 1913. She was nine years old. She, she was the oldest in her family, and she had a younger brother. They came with their parents, and they came from Russia, but they were Germans. Mm-hmm. So they were the Volga Germans, and that's a topic that people can look up and, and mm-hmm. yeah. learn a, a lot about. But apparently in Germany, they were recruited by Catherine the Great to come to Russia. Mm -hmm. And then about 100 years later, the promises that she'd made to them, which included that they didn't have to be conscripted into the military, were were being taken away, those promises. And so the families 
that were the Volga Germans emigrated to the United States. A lot of them came to Nebraska and South mm -hmm. Dakota and then some to Colorado. Mm -hmm. And my grandmother eventually ended up in Fort Morgan, Colorado, where my mm -hmm. dad grew up. Mm -hmm. And they were involved in the sugar beet industry. Right. You know, that's really interesting a part of history. I used to teach Russian history and culture. So mm -hmm. um, during the time of Peter the Great and then Catherine the Great following, they did, Peter the Great went on a tour of Europe and he just like recruited people, shipbuilders, because he wanted to build a navy. And so he did bring a lot of Germans and uh, foreigners of all different kinds. But it's really interesting that in Russia, there was the foreign quarter, but at that time, the word for foreign and the word for German were the same word. So it was either the German or the foreign quarter. Um, so that's an interesting piece of Russian history. But there's, there's a very large population of um, ethnic German Russians and German Jews that went to live in, in Russia. Yeah, and the heritage I have is the food, noodles and butter balls. <laughs> <laughs> I remember having that as a child, and I fix it myself. So yeah, yeah. that's really cool. I'm jealous because my my family came, my dad's side of the family came from Germany in the in about 1883, and they just Americanized immediately, and so there were no mm. German traditions, no language, nothing. I'm always kind of sad that we didn't have, and I'm trying to find like those traditions now, and yeah. you know, like start them for myself or you know whatever. So yeah, just start it up again. Yep, exactly. Okay, we have two more things, and, but I want to ask about this. You mentioned, this is a while ago, and you just kind of happened to just drop this little nugget, uh, but it's something to do with Abraham Lincoln. Oh, yes. In Ira C. Tyson's biography, autobiography, there's a little tidbit. He went to seminary in New York, and he was there at the time Lincoln was. And he writes, when Mr. Lincoln passed through the New York City on his way to Washington, he had a public reception at the City Hall, and it was my privilege to receive a bow from him, but only a bow, as he was already worn out shaking hands. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. And That's I do crazy. believe I've looked up something, and I can't remember where in some Lincoln book I have that talks about where he stopped on the train in to um, Washington, and that they do mention this particular reception in New York City. Wow. So wow. That's, that feels so cool. A lot of brushes with greatness in mm -hmm. your family. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so to kind of round out this um, little chat we're having, uh, you mentioned that you adopted your daughter, mm -hmm. who was from China. And to kind of circle back, there are some websites uh, devoted to adoption, genealogy of adopted children. And they're kind of hard to find. But we'll see if Katie has any luck. She's our resident researcher on the fly. Yeah, I, I came up with a, a few things. There's archives.com has some records. Adopted.com says it's the world's largest registry. And then, of course, Ancestry and Family Search both have some access to some records. Oh, that's good to know. Those are kind of the top ones that I came up with. Those sound good, and I, I will look at those because I would like to do some genealogy for her. Right. Or at least, you know, find about the area that she was from and that type of thing. Right. Do you, I wonder if you have to know her name and her surname? Yeah, we have a, a name that she was named in the orphanage, but that was the orphanage director's last name. So, oh, wow. <laughs> so it, is, it isn't anything from birth parents that we know of. Interesting. Which mm. is a sad loss. Did she do, I don't know if we talked about this, did she ever do the, the DNA swab? The she ancestry? did do 23andMe mm -hmm. when she was in high school. We, at the time, didn't pursue any subscription, monthly subscription, where she could have her records there. And then as people added to the registry, um, maybe be notified if there were any relatives, if there were other sisters of hers that were adopted here or in other countries. But I may have her pursue that now that she's mm -hmm. an adult. She mm -hmm. can do that, and maybe there'll be a match. Yeah, yeah, that would be really no, cool. That'd be something. It would it? be that'd be the most awesome thing as far as genealogy, yeah. true match to yeah. somebody that you didn't know you knew. You know, we've talked about it's hard enough just if you're from another country to do to find records, but then if you're from another country and adopted, I just yeah. like holy mm -hmm. cow, that's got to be really difficult yeah. to. Especially, yeah. I mean, somewhere like China is not always the most forthcoming. And True. it's frustrating because, you know, like uh, what we do is, okay, I know my, you know, my grandmother's name and where she was born. 
and what year she was born. But you can't even do that yeah. if you're adopted mm-hmm. you, unless you were lucky enough to have just a little snippet of something. Right. But it's like you are just finding um, a needle that's not even in a haystack, you know, <laughs> yes. and you're just searching and searching. And that's and that's um, uh, that's too bad. You know, it's, it's yeah. sad that the folks can't do that. Uh, be able to look it up. But hopefully, maybe with uh, some of these websites, if you yeah. uh, listeners are um, have uh, some sort of the same similar scenario in your life, maybe that will help to kind of have a baby start. Yes. <laughs> you know, right, a little tiny right. start. I'm thinking that the best hope would be for a genetic DNA match. So how did we do regarding your pop quiz, Robin? Did we get A pluses? I oh, know you, you certainly got an A plus. <laughs> I think you all did, and (laughs) and your research especially. Yes. Well, thank you. I mean, I just started looking them up, and just became fascinated with all a lot of your family members. And I I did find something that I didn't mention uh, earlier, but one of the accusers of Rebecca Nurse, or two of them, I think they were in the same family. Their last name was Putnam. Yes, Anne Putnam was one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and she's the one who recanted, but. When I was looking, there, there, I, there's a wiki tree out there with Caleb Pillsbury. Yes, from, my Revolutionary War yeah, ancestor. 1752 to 1832. And the wiki page lists, you know, a lot of those generations. But the creator of that wiki page is a John Putnam. Oh. So I'm wondering <laughs> if, I mean, I get kind of chills <laughs> thinking, you know, was that person ended up being related yeah. You know, to the Pillsbury's and, you know, the nurses. And so Through the Mac family, yeah. Yeah, for, you know, just a couple generations later. So I thought that was an interesting yeah. find. Yeah, when I started yeah. digging, it just kept on going, you know, the rabbit yeah, hole. the rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's fun, you know, because you're just like, this is great. I keep finding stuff. Yeah. And this so. isn't even my family. But yeah. <laughs> it was completely interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And that's fun, too, because it's like a little mini history lesson. Yeah. 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 It's fun to touch history through your ancestors. Yeah. All right. And if you are a avid listener of this podcast, uh, here's our disclaimer. The three of us are not certified genealogists. We are just three people who are sitting around and having a chat about genealogy. We hope that some or all of this information helps you along the way to finding your family. The other thing I wanted to mention is that don't forget ArapahoLibraries.org your library of choice, we hope, Mm -hmm. Uh, you can find some genealogy information by uh, going to uh, the research tab on our website and touching genealogy and history and then selecting uh, Ancestry.com or MyHeritage or the Colorado Historic Newspaper Collection. This is our 15th episode, and we're quite proud of it. Yes, we are. Because we have come a long way in this genealogy podcast, and we appreciate you folks listening. Thank you, Robin, for joining us. Thank you for and, inviting uh, me. You're welcome. Yes, and we expect updates if you find anything juicy. Of yeah, course. Right. Exactly. The juicier, the better. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening. Say goodbye, ladies. Goodbye, goodbye ladies. ladies. All right. Thanks. We'll see you.